I'll tell you how risky life is. You're not going to get out alive. Money, no problem. Economics, no problem. Future, no problem. Some people are always pulled back, back, back by the past. Without dreams and visions, people perish. Shortly put, I'll do it or die. It would be nice if someone just gave you this, gave you this, gave you this. If you saw my library, you would be impressed. One day I'd had it up to here, I blew it to smithereens. The poor pessimist leads an ugly life. He was an American author, entrepreneur, and motivational speaker. His story and his work influenced the personal development industry. He's the author of 17 written audio and video media. He's Jim Rohn, and here are his top 10 rules for success. It comes from a Bible phrase that says, if two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing is impossible. So by yourself, sometimes it's really tough. But if you can get somebody to join you and say, come on, let's do this. Uh, let's do it is a very powerful phrase. You rarely hear someone say, I'm going to go conquer the world. But uh, you could hear the phrase, let's go conquer the world. Let's be best in our industry. Let's be number one. The power of let's. So I learned the value of that. All of my entrepreneurial projects are, you know, not just myself, but uh, two, three, four, getting together to accomplish something unique. Here's the next attitude disease. Over caution. Some people never will have much. They're too cautious. Now you can also be too reckless, but you can also be too cautious. This is called the timid approach to life. And my caution was always the risk. Risk used to drive me right up the wall. I used to say, what if this happens? It's called the language of the poor. What if this happens? And on top of that, if this was to happen, look at the fix I'd be in. I better not try. I could always ace myself out. Then I'll tell you what changed my whole life when I finally discovered it's all risky. The minute you were born, it got risky. If you think trying is risky, wait till they hand you the bill for not trying. If you think investing is risky, wait till you get the tab for not investing. See, it's all risky. Getting married is risky. Having children is risky. Going into business is risky. Investing your money is risky. It's all risky. I'll tell you how risky life is. You're not going to get out alive. <laughs> that's risky. The Englishman says, well, if that's the way it's going to work out, let's give it a go. Right, that's what it's for. Give it a go. Somebody says, yeah, but I'm looking for safety and security. Fine, then huddle in a corner. We'll cover you with a sheet, bring you three meals a day. And we'll protect you, feed you, look after you, care for you, we won't let anything happen to you, and you'll probably live to be 100. The guy said, well, yeah, I'd live to be 100, but what a way to live. Right, what a way to live safe and secure. Don't ask for security, ask for adventure. Better to live 30 years full of adventure than 100 years safe in the corner. And see, it's not important how long you live. What's important is how you live. Now, let me give you the secret. Shelf said, here's the secret, Mr. Rohn. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I got that, it turned my life around. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. He said, if you work hard on your job, you'll make a living. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune. If you would have known me at age 25, you would have said, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. If you'd have known me, you'd have said that. I'm the guy, I don't mind coming a little bit early, staying a little bit late, I don't mind that. You'd have said, well, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. You'd say, well, how come he's got pennies in his pocket and nothing in the bank and behind on his promises? Well, I was a hard worker, but I was working hard on my job, not on my so, I'm telling you, if you'll learn that simple little principle and start the process today, latest tomorrow, I'll give you tonight to think it over. <laughs> and start this whole process of personal development, work on yourself, 
make yourself more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, you can so dynamically change your income and economics is the least of the values that you can start earning in terms of equity. If you'll start working harder on yourself than you do on your job. Work hard on yourself and develop the skills. Work hard on yourself and develop the graces. All of the stuff necessary to become more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, your whole life can explode into change. Promotions, no problem. Becoming more valuable to the company, I'm telling you, no problem. Money, no problem. Economics, no problem. Future, no problem. If you just go to work on the right thing. Not get things out there to change. Don't try to change the seed. Don't change the soil. Don't change the sunshine. Don't change the rain. Don't change the mix of seasons. Let the miracle of everything that's available work for you and start working on the inside. Work on your philosophy. Work on your attitude. Work on your personality. Work on your language. Work on the gift of communication. Work on all of your abilities. And if you'll start making those personal changes, I'm telling you, everything will change for you. A person who has purpose in their life, they have something to go for, some meaning. One writer described it, for some people it becomes a magnificent obsession. And for you and I, maybe it doesn't need to be that dramatic as a magnificent obsession. But it has to be something that does something to us, something that pulls us, especially into the future. You know, there are many influences on us. One is the influence of the past. Some people are always pulled back, back, back by the past. Some people are always pulled aside by the distractions, the distractions. But here's what's powerful. If you have a list of high purpose in your life, it pulls you toward the future. And the more powerful the purpose is, the stronger it pulls. And here's the other great advantage if you have purpose for the future. It pulls you through all kinds of challenges and all kinds of difficulties. If you don't have these strong purposes for the future, it's easy to get swallowed by a bad day. It's easy to be almost annihilated by a poor month. And it's easy sometimes to almost disappear beneath the waves of a, a year that goes backwards if you don't have something to pull you beyond that year. So if you want something to pull you through all kinds of challenges, all kinds of difficulties and things that come at you, you've got to have something on out there beyond today, beyond next week, beyond next month, beyond this year that pulls you into the future. And the clearer it is, the stronger it pulls. The more, the more dynamic it is, the more it affects your life, your spirit, your heart, your soul. It also creates imagination. It gets your mind working on how to achieve that purpose. And if your mind will work, and if your heart works, and if your spirit works, and if you have good input, like good ideas, I'm telling you, there isn't anything you can't accomplish. So that's one of the great powers that'll make a variable of you, and that is purpose. You've got to keep dreaming. Ronald Reagan, president, said to the joint session of Congress a few weeks ago, the republic is a dream. And if we don't keep dreaming, we will lose the republic. Your better future is a dream for yourself and for your family. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to be? What do you want to see? You've got to dream dreams. There's a Bible phrase that says, without dreams and visions, people perish. You've got to have something to go for that inspires the heart and the soul. Dream. From the children of Sanchez, it says, take the crumbs from starving soldiers, they won't die. Take the bread from hungry children, they won't cry. But without dreams, we all will die. You've got to dream. Don't lose your dreams for yourself, for your future, for your family. The dreams of love and enterprise and travel and doing things, becoming something unique on your journey here. Don't lose your dreams. Do some dreaming. Resolve. Resolve says I will, two of the most powerful words in the language. Benjamin Disraeli said nothing can resist a human will that will stake its existence on its purpose. Shortly put, I'll do it or die. Best definition of resolve I got from a little junior high girl 
Foster City, California. I'm going through some words one day. I got to this one and I asked the kids, who can tell me what resolve means? Some didn't know, some tried. Interesting. The last one was the best. A little girl about three rows back, she said, I think I know Mr. Owen. I said, what? She said, I think resolve means promising yourself you will never give up. I said, that's the best I've ever heard. She's probably giving seminars somewhere today, right? I mean, that's the best I've heard. I asked the kids, how long should a baby try to learn how to walk? How long would you give your average baby? Before you say, hey, enough, enough, no. Any mother in the world would say, you're crazy. My baby is going to keep trying what? Until, what a magic word. I want you to write it down. Until. Promise yourself you'll read the books until your skills change. You'll go to seminars until you get a handle on it. You'll listen to it until it makes sense. You'll go for it until you understand it. You'll practice it until you develop the skill. Never give up until, however long that is. Step by step, piece by piece, book by book, word by word, apple by apple. Walk around the block, walk around the block. Go for it. Don't miss the chance to grow and resolve that you'll pay the price until you learn, change, grow, become. Then you'll discover some of life's best treasures when you pay that price. There's great power in self-reliance. Self-reliance means you simply look mostly to yourself. It would be nice if someone just gave you this, gave you this, gave you this, it would be nice if everyone did their job exactly as they're supposed to do it. But here's what you've got to do. Primarily rely on yourself. Primarily say, I'm the person responsible. And I will learn the necessary skills so that I can help people learn their skills. If I need lots of people to do certain things to build my organization, that is what I must have. But I've got to be the final backstop. I've got to be the final one that people can rely on. So that if this is missed and this is missed, I can catch up. I can fill the gap. I can do the job. We have to do it when we conduct meetings. We have to do it when we conduct training. We have to do it when we're in a class of just a few. What someone might have missed, we're there to fill in. Self-reliance. Primarily, we're learning to count on yourself. So that you can do this, never complain and never explain. Your philosophy comes from what you learn, comes from what you know, comes from other people's experiences. Three ways now to learn from other people. Here's number one, learn from what you see. One of the great watchwords of these early years of the 21st century, pay attention. If you just watch, you can pick up clues. Success leaves clues. And if you'll be a better observer, of the winners and the losers, those that are doing well and those that are falling behind. And just take mental notes and good notes and say, I'm going to adjust what I'm doing based on what I see. Here's number two. We learn so much from other people based on what we hear. Here's good advice on that. Be a selective listener. Listen to voices of value that have experience, ideas, reputation, something valuable to share. Now here's number three, read all the books. Now there's millions of books, so you can't read all the books. But make this note, read all the books you need to read to make you as wealthy as you want to be, as healthy as you want to be, as prosperous, as productive, as unique a human being as you want to be. To be. Read all of those books. Don't leave those books go unread. My mentor got me started on my library when I was 25. I got one of the best. If you saw my library, you would be impressed. I haven't read everything in it, but I feel smarter just walking in it, right? <laughs> my library. I was smart enough to buy it all. Now I gotta be smart enough to read it all. Now jot this down. When you do read, you have to sort through what you read and decide which is valuable to try. That's part of the process of learning. Gathering information and sorting through it. One, the information that would apply to you and what you think would be valuable based on your current philosophical opinion. So read all the books. 
Our lives are greatly affected by what we learn and what we know. Disgust. Disgust is a negative emotion, but it can have a very positive, powerful effect. Disgust says, I've had it. What an important day that could be. I've had it. I met a beautiful, powerful, accomplished executive lady in New York. The company invited me to come in. This lady was the vice president, extraordinary lady. I got to know her and I, I found out her story. I said, how did you get here? Big income. And she never went to, high, never went to college, never went to university. I said, how did you get here? Executive, powerful, income. She said, well, let me tell you part of the scenario. She said, when I was a young mother a few years ago, she said, one day I asked my husband for $10. And he said, what for? She said, before that day was over, I decided I would never, ever ask. Again. She said, I started studying opportunity, found it, took the classes, put myself through the schools, did the scenario. Now I'm vice president. I make a lot of money. And she said, I kept my promise. I've never, ever had to ask again. It's called a life changing day. The day you say, enough is enough. Now, if you can add an act to your disgust, it helps. The man takes a shotgun to his car, blows out every window, destroys every tire, puts 100 rounds in it and says, I've driven this embarrassing thing for the last time. <laughs> and then he saves it. He saves it. And later when somebody says, how did you become rich and powerful? He says, let me show you this car. One day I'd had it up to here, I blew it to smithereens. <laughs> enough is enough. Power. Pessimism, the deadly disease of always looking on the bad side, the problem side, the difficult side, checking all the reasons why it can't be done. The poor pessimist leads an ugly life. He doesn't try to figure out what's right. He tries to figure out what's wrong. He doesn't look for virtue. He looks for faults. And when he finds them, he's delighted. How ugly. This is the poor guy looks through the window, doesn't see the sunset. He sees the specks on the window. <laughs> and this is the poor guy, right, who rushes up, takes such leave of his senses. This guy rushes up and he says, I've got five good reasons why it won't work. He's so dumb, he doesn't know. All he needs one. He's got five. five. <laughs> To the pessimist, the glass is always half empty. To the optimist, the glass is half full. Why would the same measure affect people two different ways? Answer, it all depends on how you look at it. Our lives are mostly affected by the way we think things are, not the way they are. The way we think they are affects us most. There's a subject we don't have time to get into tonight called better thinking habits. One of the major things Shove taught me when I met him, he said, poor thinking habits keeps most people poor. Not poor working habits. Most people work hard, but they don't think hard. And Shove taught me that the mind is like a factory, a mental factory. And whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. And that's what builds the economic, social, financial fabric of your life. He quoted me a Bible phrase that says, as you think, so you become. How awesome. When he talked about poor thinking habits, he had me. I used to start the day reading the morning newspaper. I mean, you can believe that or not. I'd get a cup of coffee and read the paper. I'd load up on wars and riots and murders and stabbings and killings and bank robberies and muggings and car wrecks and tragedies. 
I'd even read the back pages. I seem to like that stuff for some weird reason. I'd load up on all that, and then I'd start the day. You can imagine the kind of days I used to have. <laughs> you walk around on your financial knees. They call you economic peewee. <laughs> the guy says, I want to be a great leader. Wonderful. The first thing we do is follow him to his house. When we get there, we walk in and check his library, number one. Somebody says, well, why check his library? The reason is because what a man reads pours massive ingredients into his mental factory, and the fabric of his life is built from those ingredients. You would not believe what some people have got in their house to read. You would not believe. One of the best dressed up words I know for a lot of it is trash. Can you imagine dumping a barrel of trash into this mental factory every day and coming out with a rich, dynamic, positive life? It can't be done. You might as well try making a cake with cement. Mr. Shelf gave me one of the greatest phrases when I first met him when he said, Jim, every day stand guard at the door of your mind. How important. Stand guard at the door of your mind. And you decide what goes into your mental factory. Don't let anybody just dump anything they want to in your mental factory, because you've got to live with the results. Thank you. And one of the most important um, uh, aspects of that for me was learning how to set goals. Right. My mentor one day said to me, Mr. Rung, um, let me see your current list of goals and let's go over them and talk about them. He said, I've got some experience. I'm sure I can help you. And I said, I don't have a list. He said, really? He said, I can tell you right now, if you don't have a list of your goals, I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars. Wow. Which he did. Wow. <laughs> and that got me thinking. I said, do you mean my bank balance would change if I had a list of goals? He said, drastically. <laughs> That was the day I learned how to set goals. Okay. Decide what you want. You know, write them all down. Who do you want to meet? Make that list. The books you want to read? Make that list. The places you want to go? Make that list. The experiences you want to have? Make that list. Education for your family? Make that list. So I started making all these lists. Then he said, just start checking them off. So at first I put a lot of little things on my list so I could check off something almost every day. Right. Because that's what's fun. Right. Then he said, if you check off something significant, celebrate. Right. Because that'll inspire you to even develop a longer list. Welcome all experiences. You never know which one is going to turn everything on. Don't put up the walls. The same wall that keeps out disappointment keeps out happiness. Take down the walls. Go for the experience. Let it teach you. Learn to measure progress. Once you've set up a project now, you want to turn nothing into something, now you must measure your progress. How are you doing? Here's how we teach it to our children. Life expects us to make measurable progress in reasonable time. Measurable progress in reasonable time. That is the game of life. So part of it is not just to set up the proposed project, but as we start working on it, we start measuring how we're doing. Now first, what is reasonable time? You can't ask someone every five minutes, how are you doing now? See, that's too soon. Guy says, I haven't left the building yet, give me a break. Now we can't wait five years, that's too long. So there's reasonable time, so make this note now, what is reasonable time? One, at the end of the day. A conversation a father should have with his daughter today because the magic is there. If he waits till tomorrow, the magic may be gone. Today. Next is a week. Make that note. Usually, we get paid by the week. Somebody adds up our value to the marketplace, out comes the check. The next week, somebody adds up our value to the marketplace, out comes the check. 
What I learned to do is to change my value to the marketplace so the check kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I didn't have to change the economy. I only had to change myself. Measure your own progress. Success is a numbers game. We demanded of our children, how many years do you want your child to spend in fourth grade? Approximately. About one year, right? You say, well, if they're nice kids, would you give them three or four years? You say, no, this is not a nice game. This is getting ready for the future. This is getting ready for the challenges and the opportunities. You can't linger in one grade more than one year. Now make this note. The same should go for us as adults. Don't linger more than one year in one grade of learning. Adult management, entrepreneurship, leaderships of all kind. Keep up the pace of learning. Okay. The numbers. Measure. Count. Now here's the key. Face the truth. If you're only making this much progress, you know, there's no use trying to kid the world, no use trying to kid anybody else, and especially don't kid yourself. If in a period of time you've only made so much progress, you just got to swallow hard and say, this is the truth. I've got to face it. Now, what could I do to start increasing my progress and make my health better, make my income better, make my investments better, make my value to the marketplace much better, get busy learning the second skill and the third skill and the next language and the next language to increase my value. I gotta get busy and do that. See if you will do that, I promise you. One of the greatest motivating factors in the world is progress. And if you'll measure it, you'll get excited.